Well, I'm happy to introduce our today's speaker, Denis Nardin from the University of Regensburg, and he is going to talk on Hermitian K theory of the Dedekind domains. Спасибо за приглашение. Sorry, that's as far as I can get with the Russian, but thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, no matter how virtually. And today I like to talk about uh, an aspect of a very big project that uh, we have been working on for quite a while now, and that has recently come out on the archive. Uh, I might also say a few things about parts of it that haven't come out yet, but most of it is going to be actually concentrated in the third paper of the series, um, which you can find on the archive. The title is Hermitian K theory of stable, four stable infinity categories, uh, growth and big groups of rings. But it's a joint work with uh, eight other people. Uh, I wrote the names, I'm not going to say them aloud, uh, but apparently people have started to refer these as, as hashtag nine uh, for brevity. So I'm going to confirm to the use. So, okay, let me start with part one, uh, Dramatis Personae. Uh, so who, what are we talking about here? So let me remind you very quickly of something you probably did in your first year of undergrad, but maybe not in quite in this generality. So let R be a community ring. A symmetric bilinear form. is a bilinear map, sorry, is a pair, P, B, where P is a finitely generated projective R module, and B from P tensor over R P to R, is uh, well a, a, a bilinear map which is symmetric. That is b x comma y is the same as b y comma x, and uh, um, that is b is an element of home p tensor p over r into r a linear fixed points where C2 acts by swapping, by, by the swap action on the first argument of home. And okay, and we say that B is unimodular if the induced map B goes to home R P R used in the usual way by the home tensor adjunction is an isomorphism. Uh, some people are occasionally confused by this term. Unimodular doesn't mean that the determinant of the matrix is one. It means that the determinant is a unit. Um, we got complaint about this terminology actually, but I think it's classical. Uh, just that in the case when R is Z, of course, uh, the two notions almost coincide. Okay, so we are interested in classifying uh, unimodular bilinear form. Symmetric bilinear forms. And uh, uh, well, we, we, you should have done some results. You should remember some results from your undergrad years. So for example, when R is an algebraically closed field, all uh, symmetric bilinear forms of the same rank, by which, by, by rank, I mean the rank of the projective module, of course, uh, are isomorphic. That's not very exciting. Dennis? Oh, yeah, sorry, all unimodular. Uh, yes? So unimodular just means non-degenerate. 
Uh, the literature is confusing. Um, let me use Unimodular and, and, and to mean precisely what I, what I wrote here. Okay. Uh, some people use non-degenerate in one meaning, some people use non-degenerate in another meaning. Let me be as little ambiguous as I can. Uh, so, okay, that's another example. When R is the field of real numbers, uh, non-degenerate symmetric bilinear forms. Uh -huh. uh, sorry, uh, unimodular. You, you, you distracted me. Uh, uh, in general, symmetric bilinear forms uh, uh, are classified by the rank and the signature which you can think, I don't know, the dimension of the biggest uh, positive definite subspace. I don't want to give too many details now, but okay. This is, these are two examples where we can classify when R is Z, there are a lot of unimodular symmetric bilinear forms. I don't think there is a close form for the classification. It's, uh, it's very messy. So when this happens, uh, normally we try to simplify the problem to get a handle, to get something we can, um, we can actually state. So we note, so remark, there is some structure you can take you can take the sum of two symmetric bilinear forms. So you have PB plus P prime, B prime, and this gives you, you can take P prime, P plus P prime and B plus B prime, where B plus B prime is just the, ortho the classical orthogonal form. And these actually the sum of two unimodular things is still unimodular. Um, so, so this has a structure of a monoid. So isoclasses of symmetric, of sorry, unimodular symmetric bilinear forms form a monoid. And uh, so the, we have a standard technique to simplify monoids. Monoids are complicated, as everyone knows, but uh, groups are simple. I hope it is a commutative monoid. Yeah, right? uh, yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. It's a commutative monoid. Yeah, right. Uh, nothing I said was false so far, uh, but yeah, the monoid is also commutative, of course, as you can immediately verify. So we can group complete and these actually simplifies the, the answer. So let me define, since it's a pretty important object, and let me call it the genuine symmetric zero to growth in the group of A is the group completion of isoclasses of unimodular symmetric bilinear forms. And the genuine will be clear in a second why I'm putting this G in front because it turns out that there is more than one thing you can call symmetric and you, you want to distinguish them. Um, okay, and so now, for example, we can see that this is simpler because if you take Z, this is actually isomorphic to the real one. So even if uh, symmetric linear forms over Z are, are confusing, are really messy, uh, that are the, the, the up to group completion, they are determined by just two invariants, the rank and their signature over R. And as you will see, something similar happens more generally. So this is actually a lot easier to get a handle on. Um, and we can actually hope uh, to, to understand it better. But 
since here I assume people have seen algebraic key theory already, no one is going to be surprised when I say that actually the best definition, the better definition we can give is not just the growth and beat. Uh, well, let me put a CL here for one second. Not just the growth and beat uh, group, but oh, I didn't say the name actually. Sorry, this is the growth and beat. Group, but the growth and bit spectrum, which instead of taking isoclasses, we take in the groupoid of unimodular symmetric but linear forms, and we group complete. Uh, and that's sorry, that's the growth and bit space. I want to emphasize that this is the space, uh, because as you will, as we will, as we will see, uh, when you go to Hermitian key theory, uh, some negative homotopy groups appear when you work with the spectrum. But so far, let's talk about the space. And that little CL at the bottom left is the classic. It's a classical. It's this is an old definition. This is Carubi uh, de la Mayor. Actually, let me attribute. Uh, I don't remember the precise. Yeah, actually, let me, let me give you, uh, oh yeah, 1971. It's a very natural definition, actually, but, uh, okay. So we are interested not only in growth maybe zero, but as usual, we want to study the higher growth maybe groups. You mean the construction, for instance, like plus construction? Uh, yeah, let me say it's yes and no. Um, what happens is that in general, for a general ring, there is no uh, no symmetric bilinear form that generates the group completion. Such that you know, so what happens classically, what happens for example for K theory is that V is a summoned so every, every projective module is a summoned of R to the N for some N. And you would like for a bit to be the, to, to say the same that PB is a summand of some, I don't know, V, B tilde, N for every N, but that doesn't happen in general. So when it happens, you do have a description as the plus construction. So if two is invertible, then it happens, right? If two is invertible, it happens, and it happens much more generally. It happens uh, for Z, for example, it happens. Oh, I mean, it happens, for example, every time every element of your ring can be written as a sum or difference of squares. Uh, it happens quite often, but it doesn't always happen. So you have to be a bit careful. And okay. I want to be careful. Okay. But for example, yeah, let me write it. For example, the version bit space of Z is uh, growth in bit zero times B O infinity infinity Z plus where O infinity infinity is um, well I'll, I'll define later what it is but it's essentially the limit of the automorphisms of this symmetric bilinear form. Okay. Yes, okay. oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. That's that. I gave the, the wrong one. One minus one, one minus one, one minus one. Ah. Ah, sorry, no, that was really not the, the right thing that I wrote. Okay. But now this is true. But the point is that there is not a canonical choice of form, unfortunately, that works for every ring. So you have to, to play a little bit. Okay. But since we are talking so, about what happened, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so the last few comments means that uh, you do not assume that uh, two is inevitable in the in your ring. No, I'm okay. very much not assuming it. Okay, very much not assuming that. Okay, yeah, thank you. On some level, okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Is not invertible. And in fact, since we are really talking about what two is, when two is not invertible, let me put a remark here that's going to be sort of this 
starting point, a starting point for this. We can generalize. We have a different, we have another notion, another interesting notion, which actually goes all the way back to Karuga and Meyer, I think. Um, and people didn't quite know what to do with this other notion. So a uh, quadratic form. So a quadratic form is a pair, P comma Q, where P as usually is a finitely generated projective R module. And R is still commutative for now, but I'm, I'm going to, to far generalize very quickly, but let me give this other example. And Q from P to R is a function, not a linear function, such as these two, sorry, these two properties. Uh, one q of r x is r square for q x, and two this function the q of x y, which is q of x plus y minus q of x minus q of y, is bilinear, and it's naturally symmetric just by definition. That's called the polarization. Let me copy this and go to the next page. And before you went to the next page, one small question. As mm -hmm. far as I recall, uh, I, some people, in, when defining groton dequid groups of rings, some people impose some Lagrangian relation. Oh, yeah, I mean the, uh, that's actually automatic in this case because I'm okay. working with affine skin, it's not automatic when you work with non-affine skins. It's sort of uh, like when you work with, uh, with- Okay, uh, so plus equals to short exit sequences, something like that, right? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Uh, I'm going, I'm going to, 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 to explore this more in detail later. But okay, uh, you're right, in general, you have some Lagrangian relations, but uh, as long as you work with affine schemes, you don't need to. Yeah, thanks. And of course, the Lagrangian relations are also going to be important for the Witt group, which I'm going to mention very soon. But uh, let me, okay, we have these quadratic forms. Okay, and they say, and we say Q is unimodular uh, if BQ is, if it's polarization, yes. So what does it mean? Concretely, Q, you should think of Q is a function. Sorry, sorry, what? You were... If BQ is unimodular. So BQ is a symmetric bilinear form, mm -hmm. which is defined like this, called the polarization of Q. I think that Q is unimodular if its polarization is. Oh. So completely Q is a function given by a, se a second degree, uh, sorry, yeah. Degree two, that's a funny degree, uh, homogeneous polynomial if P is free. Um, so, for example, in an example, you can consider P is uh, Z to two and Q of uh, X1, X2. We can consider this guy here. You can see that BQ is a form given by uh, the matrix zero one one zero. Um, and actually, let me also put a remark. Q from P to R is quadratic if and only if there exists B tilde uh, bilinear, but not necessarily symmetric, such that Q of X is B tilde of X comma X. So in this sense, you can think of them as given by degree two homogeneous polynomials. In fact, the abelian group of quadratic forms is 
is isomorphic to hum p uh, sorry p uh, r modulo c2 and the and the polarization is the image under the norm map And sorry, the identification is the one I said, the one that sends a, a form B tilde to the function B tilde of x comma x. And then you can, it's an easy computation to see that the polarization is exactly B tilde gets sent to B tilde of x comma y plus B tilde of y comma x. Okay. Okay, now you can do the same theory for you can do the same theory for quadratic form. And you get GW genuine quadratic. Again, the genuine will be um, clear. And, uh, and a polarization map. Like this. I don't know how to call it polarization, I guess. We don't have a specific name in our in our paper. Okay. But when you have so I hope this was not completely new for everyone, but the point is that when you have two notions, you start suspecting that there might be a more general way of treating them on the same level, especially since so far I've talked about symmetric and quadratic, but you could also have like anti-symmetric forms and symplectic forms that are the anti-symmetric version of quadratic forms. And so, and then you can go much more general. People have invented stuff like rings with involution uh, and they actually do show up in geometric topology. So. We would like some kind of unified framework to deal with all these examples. And there has been several attempts throughout the years. And I'm going to present uh, our version, which I like, and I think it's very, it's very convenient. So we define, okay, so I'm going to define a special case of this. We define it more generally for all stable infinity categories, but I will concentrate on rings so far. So let uh, be a ring. Now note that there is no commutative in front of it anymore. This works for any um, for any ring. So then uh, Poincaré structure. On R is a functor. Kappa from proj R up to spectra. Uh, such that uh, there exists a duality. Maybe I'll explain better later what is a duality. But if you think of like the um, uh, involution on Proj R, you're not going to be very wrong. Uh, and N in Z, such that for every PQ in Proj R, we have kappa of P plus Q is kappa of P plus kappa of Q plus, um, uh, what do I mean? I mean this nth suspension of hum from P to the dual of Q. Okay, this is a, actually a very, it's actually a theorem that the Poincare structures as we define them in the paper are given by this data in the case of a ring, but I'm going to take it as a definition. And then I'll 
So, okay, let me actually quickly say what I mean by a duality. A duality is just a functor. So in mind, the mark, a duality is a functor B from prosh R up to prosh R uh, plus a map, a natural transformation the sort of double dual identification, which is an equivalence uh, such that a certain diagram commutes. I hope I can write it correctly. No, no, I probably cannot, but uh, yeah, because this goes in this, no, this goes this way. And then you have, so this is eta of the, eta of the dual, this is the dual of eta, and this is the identity. So this is a classic. Uh, yeah, excuse me. What do you mean by the notation prosh r op? Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, prosh r is the category of projective r modules, finitely generated projective r modules. This is not the right category, nothing else, uh, just projective uh, r modules. Sorry? Uh, these are not uh, derived category of something. No, 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 no. You, you are right. Uh, in the, the definition that we give in the paper, it actually works for the, the perfect derived category of R. It's a functor on the perfect derived category. But as I said, uh, for simplicity for this talk, I'm going to, to give this definition of concrete structure that works only for rings, but uh, for affine schemes, if you want. but. Uh, I hope it's going to be more concrete. Um, okay, okay. Uh, it's very good that you are more concrete. Mm -hmm. um, uh, say... Perfect complexes are going to appear soon, so you, you, you're not going to avoid it. I avoid them, but at least for the examples, I hope I can give you uh, mm -hmm. some concreteness. Uh, if R uh, is a commutative ring, uh, and uh, is it possible to take is if R uh, is a commutative ring, uh, is it possible to take n equal zero? Yes, or even when it's non-commutative, sure. Mm -hmm. But you, you you need actually well you you see in a second why you need the flexibility of this added n. This okay, gives you okay. the shifted possibilities. Mm -hmm. And sorry, okay. um, since you, you mentioned it, that R cannot be commutative, of course, I need to be uh, careful and say left R modules. I can't forget about it, but of course. That's... So actually, let me, yeah, let me copy this definition. And then. Sorry, uh, Dennis. Yes. Uh, is the definition of duality you give the same, uh, I mean, is the diagram equivalent to G being self-adjoint? Yes. Okay. In fact, duality technically is giving us a homotopy fixed points of the C2 action on the category of categories, but okay. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, and then that's okay, but that there is a, there are a lot of fine categorical facts we could talk about, but okay. Let me try instead of giving you some examples and then I'll actually show you that we can completely classify these concrete structures in this case. Uh, and maybe I'll say a couple of words also why I need spectra and not the derived category of abelian groups as someone might intuitively think. So, Actually, let me say this COPPA P, you should think of it as the group of uh, quadratic of quadratic forms on P. That's the, the intuition you should have for this whole theory. So of course we can start with COPPA P. We can take the Eilenberg COPPA, sorry, GSP. This is the Eilenberg uh, MacLean spectrum of, uh, of symmetric bilinear forms on P for R commutative. 
uh, and in this case, we have n equals zero and the dual of P is in fact just the dual. This is an exercise if you want, it's easy to see. And you can do the same thing. You can take the Allen-Marie McLean spectrum of quadratic forms of P. By this, you mean Allen-Marie McLean on GW, right? No, 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 on, on the no? abelian group, on the abelian group. Sorry, uh, let me say this differently, uh, actually. Uh, I, abelian groups sit inside spectra as Eilenberg McLean spectra. If you want spectra that has only degree zero, that leave only. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Okay, and these, then I can say these as the abelian group. I mean, literally, you know, you have a projective module and the set of symmetric bilinear forms on B form an abelian group. Because they're just okay, you just add them. Okay, yeah. Okay. Let me actually just write it like this. Perhaps it's clearer. Okay, and similarly here we take the quadratic forms which we have seen to be the quotient instead. And again, here n is zero, and the duality is the standard duality. But you can take fancy things. Uh, sorry, uh, I don't know how to denote this actually. We usually denote it with a minus. Here you can take the same thing, but the fixed points for the minus action. It is sending B of uh, B X comma Y gets sent to minus B of Y comma X. And this is just the abelian group of anti-symmetric forms. And again, we have n equals zero and the dual of P is still the standard dual, but the double dual identification changes. Uh, there are changes by a sign. And oh, maybe I should say that N and D are completely determined by COPPA you can actually reconstruct them from COPPA. So it's enough for me to, to give you the COPPA and then the other things are forced. Um, okay, you can do fancier things. You can start doing things like genuine symmetric L where L is a line bundle. So let's say L is a line bundle. Then you can take genuine symmetric of P being L valued symmetric linear forms and you can do many things. Let me give you an example with R uh, non-commutative. So let's say R ring with involution. So for example, I'm not going to give the precise definition, but think of the group algebra, which comes equipped with an involution that just uh, inverts all elements of G. Then, uh, you can take uh, this copper P, you can take, uh, what would you say? Uh, yeah. I can take R tensor R over P, let's say over Z for now. So R C2, where the C2 action not only swaps the P's, but also acts on the R. And this is essentially the value of uh, Hermitian forms, the, the group of Hermitian forms, where uh, B of X comma Y is B of Y comma X bar, and you know, B of X R Y is R bar B X Y, et cetera. Okay. Sorry, Dennis, uh, can you go back to the definition? Uh, I'm a bit confused. So uh, this isomorphism of top of P plus Q to this thing should be natural isomorphism, right? Yes, yes, you're right. I should actually be-, be No, 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 it's, it's, it's fine, but I'm confused about- Is that there is a map, a 
canonical map like this that's coming from the projection from p plus q to p and from p plus q to q and as a canonical splitting what i'm actually telling you is that this guy the the, the, the resulting summand is naturally isomorphic to to these objects yeah so that that's where my confusion is because this seems to be contravariant in both variables yes uh -huh. and also the left hand so, side is contravariant in both variables ah by definition right 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 right, right. yes okay thank you sorry okay yeah uh, you 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 pull back bilinear forms like if you have uh, yeah, I, I haven't explained what the functionality is, but if I have a bilinear form like this, and I have a map from Q to P, you can always pull it back by precomposing. Uh, okay. Is um, is it clear? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Perfect. So these are examples, and now actually let me give you a complete classification. Uh, which will give you a lot more examples. So uh, before the classification, maybe I should give a definition. So R ring, an R module with involution. M is, and I apologize, but this is what we came up with, is an R tensor R module. M. Uh, so it doesn't have only one R module structure, it has two, but they are identified because it's equipped with sigma from n to n, such that it is an involution, sigma squared is one, and sigma exchanges the two R module structures. It has the, oh, sorry, sigma n. It has these two properties here. Okay, uh, so for example, when R is commutative, every R module is an R module with involution by using the, the, the identity as involution and the two and the same R module structure for both sides. And let me give you another example. Uh, when R is a ring with involution, again, think of Z brackets G, the group algebra. Uh, R is, um, has a canonical R module with involution structure given by R tensor S times X is R X uh, sigma S and uh, the invol and sigma is the, is the involution. I, mean, I, use, I use the involution coming with R as involution. And in fact, if you go back, you see that all the definitions of symmetric bilinear and quadratic forms can take value in modules with involution. In order to talk about unimodular things, we need Actually, let me uh, copy it. This, this page just looks smaller than they are when I teach. Maybe. Uh, okay. Uh, and so we need to say that N is invertible if it is projective as an um, R module, uh, either structure is, in, is, is the same because involution gives an isomorphism of M with the first R module structure and M with the second R module structure. So that's just a single condition. And M mapping to, sorry, an R mapping to and RM is an isomorphism. Um, and again, here you have actually to use the two R module structures and involution properly to construct construct this map, but let me skip over this. Uh, it's the notion of invertibility that you would expect from these objects. Okay. 
So and I think we do another construction. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, uh, suppose R is commutative. Yes. Uh, is this notion of inevitability uh, of a module uh, uh, coincide with the uh, usual inevitability? So it is locally free of rank one. Yes. I mean, okay. uh, the point is, uh, this is more general. I mean, an R module with involution is actually not the same thing as an R module equipped with an involution. And R is commutative, unfortunately. Uh, this might be a bit confusing, but the point is that uh, the involution is actually part of the data, and the involution doesn't need to respect the R module structure. It needs to exchange the two R module structures that you have. So if you have a, an R module for when R commutative and the involution is R linear, this gives you an, an R module with involution in this sense. But you could have more things. Uh, so okay, construction. Let me and and then I'll start actually talking about Hermitian K theory uh, soon. I just wanted to be as concrete as possible. So construction. So suppose M is an R module with involution. In particular, you can think of it as an abelian group with a C2 action. And so you can consider the Tate construction, which is the spectrum whose homotopy groups are the Tate cohomology groups. There exists a Tate construction, a spectrum such that its homotopy groups are well with the usual sign change that uh, these things have Tate homology groups. And these a priori has no linear structure, but the point is that these and these comes equipped with um, R module structure. And here I really mean an R module spectrum. So it's an element of, uh, of the derived category of R. And this is coming because the Tate construction is, is lax symmetric monoidal. So M Tate C2 is an R tensor R Tate C2 module. And we use uh, the Tate diagonal. And uh, I don't want to dwell on this, but actually, if you want these to be an actual mathematical statement that's actually true, this tensor here needs to be over the sphere spectrum and not over Z, which is sort of what I was implying this whole time. Uh, but let me not dwell on, on these technicalities. Note also with word of warning, if R is commutative, there is another way of putting an R module structure on the Tate, but it's not the right way. It's not the way that is going to be relevant. So, okay. Uh, okay, so now I think it's the time to state the theorem. So uh, let R be a ring, then Poincaré structures on R are determined by an invertible module with involution, invertible R module with Evolution M, an integer, and a map, and then and a map X going to the Tate in the derived category of R, where I yield to the Tate the, the R structure that I described before. 
How does this work? Well, if you have a thing called alpha, this map, Q alpha of P is defined as the pullback of this. And now some, some homotopy limits and co-limits are going to appear. Oh, sorry, not R, M. Date. I'll explain in a second. And home uh, P comma X. What is X in the statement? X is just any element in the derived category with a map. Okay. To the date. That's completely arbitrary. Um, in fact, we'll see that different choices of X will give quadratic, symmetric, and etc. Essentially, M is determining the duality. Oh, sorry. I forgot the sigma. Got the n. Normally, we we uh, we put the the n inside the m actually. We consider m any invertible guy in the derived category, but uh, I think it's more concrete. Perhaps if I keep m separately, I am uh, just a normal module, and I put the n separately. Um, okay. So morally, m uh, encodes the duality, and x sort of difference between the different concrete structure with the same duality. Okay, um, so what should I explain? There is actually this, this is a non-trivial result. I mean, not hard, but sorry. Uh, this is a, that's a fact. Uh, the left-hand side is exact. And so it has to be of this form. So, okay, but this was, Thing. So let me give you examples. So for example, let's say R commutative, you can take uh, M equals R with its canonical module with involution structure and X is just the zero truncation of the Tate, which comes with them after the Tate. Um, and yeah, okay. And then this gives you the genuine symmetric. But you can also take uh, M still R, but X, not the zero truncation, but the two truncation of the date. And N is zero, sorry. Yeah, the relevance of n will appear in, well, when we start actually talking about L groups, but uh, okay. And in this case, you actually get the genuine quadratic I was defining before. That's an exercise. These are nice exercises with the Tate cohomology. That these guys are, this pullback here are completely concentrated in degree zero and they have, they're actually in fact the right groups. Okay, and so bolstered by these, I'm actually going to define that the people I'm interested in more, greater or equal than n, are just the one coming from these, where alpha n is the nth truncation of the teeth. So greater or equal than zero is the genuine symmetric, greater or equal than two is the Genuine quadratic. Oh, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out, in fact, that greater or equal to one is what's called the genuine even. That is, it finds you the group of even symmetric linear forms, but I haven't talked about it. So I'll let it aside. Okay. Okay. So after this, I think I'm going to talk about growth and bit spectra and L spectra and how you actually compute these guys. But hmm. let me pause for one second and ask if someone has any questions about uh, this way of encoding quadratic forms. Um, I don't quite follow, but I fear you've already explained. So can you get back to the theorem? 
Yeah, yeah. So you're saying if I have this data, like the module and a map, you explain in this diagram how to get um, the Poincaré structure. Yes. That is, that's just this pullback. Right. Oh, it's a pullback. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm defining this probably uh, kappa alpha m p to be this pullback. Okay, so if it's this pullback, then I obviously have the Poincaré structure. Well, not obviously, but it's easy. You can just yeah. You have to verify how it behave, how it behaves with respect to sums of projective modules. But it's, it's just a computation. The okay. interesting part, actually, which is non-trivial, is that every Poincaré structure comes from. Yeah, yeah, okay. From such a cool. construct. Thank you. And you said sometime before that you really need spectra and how this guy spectra or do they come from the right category? Oh, uh, that the reason why I need spectra is mm, because yeah, the point is that this state diagonal map here is not Z linear. So there are continuously all the time, there are constructions that bring you out of the derived category marine. In particular, for example, this uh, R Tate C2 here that I'm using, when R is commutative, that has an obvious R module structure, but that's not the one I'm considering. I'm considering the R module structure induced by the Frobenius in this case, which is again, not, not really Z linear. Uh, so, also, the other thing is that if I if I put the right category of a ring, uh, I wouldn't get all the notions of of, uh, of one structures that we couldn't have. There are other reasons why you want spectra, but mm. and the point is that this functor uh, as a functor. Okay, I'm just about to, to take the non-abelian derived functor of this of this Poincaré structure functor here. And you just, you just don't get the there is no way of, of formulating the, the correct definition when you land in the derived category of the set. Uh, the functoriality is wrong, so to say. Um, because these, these exactly the, and ultimately the reason is that these state diagonal maps appear, which are not Z-linear. Um, so you cannot really, so you have to twist the, 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 Z, the R module or the Z module structure by some non-Z-linear ring homomorphism. So that's why you ultimately need to use spectra. Okay. I mean, in this diagram that you, that defines this- In this diagram, structure. I technically don't need it. Okay. I mean, okay, no, okay. Oh. One thing, when R is commutative, I don't need it. But when mm -hmm. R is non-commutative, oh, I guess everything still has a Z module structure. So, okay, no. This diagram, I, you're right. In this diagram, everything could be Z linear with a caveat that you really, really need to be. Oh, okay, no, okay. the important thing is this isomorphism is not Z linear, sorry, in general. All right, that's the point. This isomorphism here that I didn't explain really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can make it zilinear if you give everything a very specific zilinear structure, but at this point, you're kind of rigging things. I mean, you're, you're, it's like saying a map of ring is zilinear because you put on the target the z algebra structure coming from this map. It's kind of a circular way of stating things. Yeah, okay. <laughs> As I said, the Frobenius is not linear. Of course, the Frobenius is linear, the Tate Frobenius. If you put on the target, the Z linear structure coming from the map. But, uh... <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. It's not... And when R is non-commutative, everything is messier, actually. But I'm, I'm not really concerned with R non-commutative. I'm just, it's actually, and I'm just being careful at saying things in a way that it works also in that setting because it works, it, it's a, uh, because it's necessary when you do surgery theory applications, but I'm not going to talk about surgery theory today. So it's more of an excess of care.
Okay, now we get GW and L. Um, okay, so if we remember, we have this kappa from Frosch R op into spectra, and this can be extended to the perfect derived category of R by taking the non-abelian derived functor al adult group. And it's not going to be very important, the details of how this extension is built, but for example, for connective chain complexes, you can use the Daltekan isomorphism, turn them into a simplicial our mod projective R module, apply COPPA, and, uh, and then take geometric realizations. But there is a, a general procedure uh, invented by Golden Puppe that works for, for any factor. And concretely, the, the square I wrote before, uh, the square states, actually, let me copy the square this square here square it's still a pullback for every p in the perfect derived category of r uh, so you can take these as the definition of the extension if you want of course this works only in this case but uh, there is a general framework that tells you that it has to extend this way. Okay, so I need a notion of unimodular forms now. So let me say the definition of Poincaré object is uh, it's a pair P and I'm gonna call it Q omega infinity cup of P, a point in the underlying space of cup of P, uh, such that the image, uh, sorry, and this is now an element in the perfect derived category, uh, the image of Q here mapping to via the fold map. Remember, we had uh, map P, sigma, and DP, and then I project. So I have a way from, from, an L, from a point here, from what we call a form on P, to get a map from P to some shift of the dual uh, is an equivalence if you want an, an isomorphism in the derived category. Uh, so that's the, the reasonable notion of uh, uh, unimodular object, which we call Poincaré object, because um, well, the original motivation is because when you take uh, compact manifolds, uh, the condition is that their cohomology, com the co-chain complex satisfies Poincaré duality is exactly this condition. So that's where Poincaré is coming from. But, and, and in this case would be the dimension of the manifold. But, okay. And what they want to say, yes. Oh, I should have said what Lagrangian was in the classical case, but okay. I'll give just a general definition. A Lagrangian is on a Poincaré object. P Q is a pair of a map from L P in the in the perfect derived category and a null homotopy of the restriction of Q to to L uh, such that sorry that's clearly not enough you want you have a map like this. You get the 
shift. Is uh, an exact a fiber sequence, or if you prefer, an exact triangle. So this is the condition. If you've ever seen what a Lagrangian is, condition this thing is L is contained in an orthogonal, and this condition is L is equal to an orthogonal. Uh, because you can think of L orthogonal as the fiber of of uh, the dual of F. Okay, so why do I define this? Oh, I define this because I want to define the, the L theory group. So L is any object. L is any, any object. Perfect complex. Then yeah. So of course, can... it has to have this additional structure and this property to be a Lagrangian, mm -hmm. but yeah. Can you please give some intuition behind this definition because I can never remember. Yeah, that. I'll give it uh, one, one second. Let me define the Witt group and then I'll show you that in the classical case, it coincides with the classical notion of bit group. And this hopefully will give some intuition. Mm. Okay, now let me give you, okay, let me do part, half of that proof already then. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> can you please have... copy this definition every time until you give enough motivation to remember it? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let me give you an example. So, let me give P, Q, uh, 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 unimodular symmetric bilinear form. And these, uh, remember, P was a projective module and B was a map from P tensor P to R. And this is a, a Poincare object in, uh, for R and Coppa, what they call genuine symmetric. This is just unwrapping the definition. Hopefully this is clear and let's see what a Lagrangian is. So let me do the case when L is, suppose L is, uh, uh, let me give an example first and then I'll do the, the more general case. So suppose L is a Lagrangian in degree zero. So L is also, um, so L is also a projective R module. Then what does this mean? Uh, this means that we are we have to also give a, a homotopy of f up a star of uh, b, but that's just b composed with f tensor f in uh, coppa joining symmetric of L. And since this guy is sorry, since the guy is discrete. Uh, this is existent, uh, there is only one possible well, uh, homotopy. But if the homotopy is not data, it's, it's just a property. So this is just asking f up a star of b is zero. Or if you want b restricted to L tensor L, it's zero. Okay, that's the first condition. And the second condition is telling you that you have a map from L to P. Then I take the dual. So this goes to the dual of L. And this is a short exact sequence. Therefore, uh, F is injective. Uh, because that's what short exact sequences are in mean, the objective. So L is a subspace of P. And moreover, the kernel of the F is exactly the X in P such that the X comma Y is zero for all Y in L because that's the F because the F sends uh, x to the x blank restricted to L. Uh, but that's exactly L orthogonal, by def I guess by definition. So 
L, so a Lagrangian in dimension zero, and maybe we should say weight zero here for those that like weight structures, but um, so Lagrangian in dimension zero is a subspace L in P such that L is equal to L orthogonal, which is the classical definition of Lagrangian. Let me give an example. Actually, let's take P, B to be uh, R2 and this symmetric linear form. Then L span of is Lagrangian. Um, is the example clear? Yes, thank you. <laughs> but that's okay. Let me actually vary a little bit and do okay. This was an example in dimension zero when Lagrangian is in dimension zero. Let's see what happens when L is of the form uh, n goes to q, where n is in degree zero and q is in degree minus one, and p is the same. So, what does it mean? Well, it means first we have a map of complexes like this. So F is just a map N goes to P. And now we need to uh, uh, oh yeah, now we need the, the, the Lagrangian condition and maybe Huh. Okay, that's the problem of doing things out of order. I forgot to define uh, the hyperbolic quadratic form. So actually, let me, before I do this example, let me do a simpler example. And I'll go back to this in one second. So P, any projective module, as before, you can form hype P, which is P plus the dual of P with form uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, or if you want x comma phi, uh, y comma psi goes to uh, psi x plus phi y, if you need the formula. Then hype p is a unimodular symmetric binary form. with Lagrangian uh, P sitting inside P plus DP, P plus zero, I guess. That's a generalization of the previous example. Um, okay. Now let me see, uh, just see here, uh, it's a bit messy to work, but the, the condition that F is Lagrangian, in this, in this example where L is in degree zero minus one, is the same as, so N goes to P plus hype Q is injective and uh, Lagrangian there. So uh, these uh, degree two Lagrangians, for those of you that have already seen bit theory a bit, uh, show that P is stably metabolic instead of being just simply metabolic as Lagrangians in degree zero. So that's also a very good reason to consider Lagrangians that are complexes and not just uh, projective modules. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, let me define now the, the L groups. Actually, let me, let me define the L groups. So, the nth L group of R comma copper is defined as the isoclasses 
of concrete objects for copper. And that's an, uh, a commutative monoid. And then quotienting by the sub monoid by the by those Poincaré objects that admit a Lagrangian. Sorry, not for kappa. Here I mean sigma n kappa, because there was an n. Uh, and that's why I need the n in the definition of Poincaré structure, because I want to be able to talk about Poincaré objects for shifted things. In order to define all the L groups and have all the longer sequences I want. And okay. Not giving nearly concrete computations as I wanted. So let me just. Okay. Now let me give you just an example that. Uh, L0 are genuine symmetric is the classical bit group. Uh, that is the monoid of a non degenerate symmetric bilinear form, the classical solid symmetric bit group, modulo those that admit a Lagrangian. So unimodular symmetric bilinear forms, modulo those that admit a Lagrangian. And that's, I believe, a bit original definition, although it was generalized much by Knebusch. So, um, and there is a map, as we have seen, like this, by seeing every unimodular symmetric linear form as, a, as an object in degree zero. Uh, and let me show that it is subjective. Okay, so this, this bit group is a classical invariant that's very important, it shows up in, in in, in many places, among which motivic homotopy theory, but not only, uh, it was instrumental in the block proof of the block cutter conjecture. But I thought that's again kind of tautological uh, when you unwrap what the definitions are. But still, it's a very does important. it matter? For... Yes. Sorry, does it matter for this definition that you consider a Lagrangian of all of any degree of any weight? So for this definition, I'm actually, sorry, a Lagrangian, let me put in dimension zero, I mean a classical Lagrangian here, a Lagrangian subspace. Mm. But uh, actually, as I've, in this example, as I've shown, uh, after group completion, if you kill off, so if, if P admits a Lagrangian in, in dimension one, uh, then P plus hype Q admits a, a Lagrangian in dimension zero. Mm -hmm. And so this is zero in the bit group, but this also was zero in the bit group. So P is also mm -hmm. zero. So in fact, that, that example was intended. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm doing things out of order. So maybe it's not clear the point of what I'm doing. Uh, but uh, the point of that example was to show that uh, I'm not really quotienting by more stuff when I quotient by Lagrangians in bigger dimension. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In fact, this corresponds like uh, in, in these bit groups in general, you have you have like a relation saying like sum of things with sum and differences of things with Lagrangians are, are zero. And considering Lagrangians in bigger dimensions, it just incorporates all these different relations in one single relation. So is it like to make a stable category instead of? Uh, yes. Uh, ultimately, yeah. what it makes well, what it makes this simpler is that perfect complexes are a stable category, and so you can take, for example, the cofiber, uh, the fiber of the map from the zero object to your object, and you get something interesting. And that allows you. To do that. 
also uh it's probably uh to i'm probably too too fast with this question but like you take in the question and the category you question in by is not actually a subcategory so what if you consider like k theories of this group or something and then do the uh you know the to the co-fiber or something like that yeah i mean okay i'm going to i i'm going to write a lot of diagrams about this uh, very very okay soon. yeah so um okay let me show just that this is subjective though so let me show suppose p now is a perfect complex with some unimodular quadratic form here and i want to show that p can be made up to lagrangians can be made sit in degree zero and i'm going to do it by induction so suppose p is represented by a complex p minus n p minus n plus one blah 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 but since p is perfect at some point it will end then i um, then i have a map you should have a map from this thing to p Sim. no this cannot be right oh that's not going to be right because i'm having the arrows going the other direction ah okay okay good I have a map from the complex that's just p minus n in degree minus n to p. And I'm going to claim this is isotropic, by which I mean that IE, so I call this f, f upper star of q uh, is zero. And this is just going to be because this guy is zero. Uh, sorry, pi zero. In fact, it has to be isotropic because uh, there is not just no space for it to be anything different. And that's because this guy sits in a, in a short exact sequence. Well, sorry, generally symmetric. Very important. That's generally symmetric. Uh, P minus n minus n something connective and here uh, you need to look a little bit at what diagram I wrote but uh, sorry so n is greater than zero yeah, n is greater than zero yeah yeah you're right I'm going to to show that n can be made equal to zero Homotopy uh, orbits, and this is uh, n connective, and this is two n connective. So this is definitely at least one connective, which is what we wanted to show. And then by a procedure like before, you can see that p minus n minus n fits as a Lagrangian between these and another object that starts with p uh, minus n plus one and here there is some other stuff that i'm not going to describe but the point is this starts one degree up so the class of p comma q is represented by something starting in degree minus n plus one this procedure is what's usually called surgery or algebraic surgery uh, okay and so by induction you can assume p comma q connected uh, but then 
the dual of P, which is isomorphic to P, is also connective. And the only uh, perfect complexes such that they are connective and their dual is connective are exactly projective modules in degree zero. So, okay, it went a bit fast, but the point is you can, by induction, by, by cutting out Lagrangians all the time, you can make P uh, connective and then P has to be equal to the dual. And if you think about it, if you have a perfect complex and you flip it, the only way for it to stay connective is if the, it's concentrating in degree zero, because otherwise the, Essentially, the last differential will have uh, some kind of co-kern. Is there a weight structure in the category of uh, yeah. yes. Like objects? Yes. The story, the fluid telling works for any cap stable category with a sufficiently nice weight structure. Um, this is much more general than making it sound. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, sorry, you're asking on Poincaré objects? No, you don't have a way on, po on Poincaré objects with like Jane Chain. In Poincaré objects, you cannot have a weight structure because it's not stable. In fact, it's a groupoid, the category of Poincaré objects. So, uh, yeah, what, what, am I, what am I asking? What are you asking? Sorry? Yeah, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, okay, okay. I, I guess I'll come up with the question later. I'm not no, exactly right. sure which category I should consider. You're right that weight structures are relevant here. In fact, they're basically... Uh, this is some version, if you want, of the weighty theorem of the heart for emission K theory. But yeah, I'm not going to say more about that. Okay. 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 So I kind of regret giving this example because I don't think it's been as enlightened as I want it to be, but uh, okay. Let me actually introduce finally Hermitian key theory. We are one hour and a half along the talk and I haven't defined Hermitian key theory yet, but I still will not define Hermitian key theory because the definition is technical, but I'm going to tell you how it behaves. So to a pair, um, C, sorry, not C, R kappa, we associate two spectra, which are ZWR kappa and RLR kappa with the following properties. Uh, so what do I want? What do I want to start? Yeah, there is a Cartesian square, G W R kappa, L of R kappa, kappa of R kappa, I'm going to be fixed points, kappa of R kappa T. I don't know if that was uh, what people were, I don't remember, someone asked something about relationship between, uh, well, anyway, this is the, the, the precise relationship between GW and L theory and then the, and K theory, where, where the C2 action on K of R sends P to Sigma and the dual of P. Then uh, the homotopy groups of this guy is exactly the L groups that I defined. And let's see, and I want to say also that there is a fiber sequence. Hmm. G, W, R, and I need to shift 
Yeah. I hope I get the shift in the right direction. And then there is this very important thing is a theorem by um, Heberstreit and Steinle that's not been published yet, but it will come out of the archive hopefully before the end of next month. Um, the underlying space of the genuine symmetric is exactly what I called the genuine symmetric gross bit space. The same for the quadratic. So this actually recovers the classical notion of growth on bit spaces. Um, okay, so why? Okay, no. If we let kappa S of B being just what we call the homotopy symmetric, and the, the homotopy quadratic, P tensor PR. Note that these are different from before, and that we are taking the homotopy fixed points and homotopy orbits. Um, L theory of R kappa S and L theory of R kappa Q are four periodic. So the L theory is very computable. Sorry, can you show the screen above a bit? Thank you. Like, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, please stop me if I'm going too fast. No. <laughs> And that's actually important because, uh, so, okay. Uh, let me actually get the bounds correctly. So, uh, okay. We have a map like this, where these are the, the truncated. Uh, objects that I defined before. Uh, you can think for n0, remember this was the genuine symmetric and for n2 was the genuine quadratic. So is uh, an iso in degrees less or equal than two and minus three and surjective in degree. Uh, less or equal than two, uh, sorry, equal to n minus two. So the negative L theory group, if you want, or the sufficiently negative L theory groups uh, are completely determined by the homotopy quadratic version, which is four periodic. So it's a finite number of groups. And the most important of all, because it's the one we're going to use to compute the emission K theory of Dedekind domains, if R is an Ethereum ring of global dimension D. So think about the case when R is a, uh, is a commutative regular Ethereum ring of cruel dimension D. For example, we have this map from this guy to this homotopy symmetric one. Um, which is um, ISO in degrees. Oh, wait, this cannot be right. Sorry, I have uh, I've written the wrong range um, in degrees greater or equal than I. I think it is n plus d minus two. No, but this cannot be. Okay. 
no, 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 sorry. No, that's completely wrong, indeed. It's D minus 2N minus 2. Yeah, yeah, okay, now that's better. Uh, minus 3, sorry, and subjective in degree. Greater or equal D minus 2N minus 2. Okay, concretely, this tells you that if you have uh, material rings of finite global dimension, you have only a finite amount of L groups to compute. There are only And in fact, uh, it's going to be a lot easier because I'm going to do in low dimension, uh, there's really not going to be that many groups to compute. And then from this square here, from the L groups, you can get the GW groups, which is what we are interested in. Okay. Okay, now I want to specialize to delicate domain. Like in the means. So before I, I go on, are there questions about this list, this laundry list of properties I gave you? Do you have any nice conditional and homotopy guys are the ordinary guys? What do you mean nice condition and homotopy guys? Ah, I mean, you have this uh, homotopy. I mean, you have the contrast when you take the homotopy orbits and homotopy. Uh, the good thing is that they're full periodic. Yeah. So actually, they're kind of hard to, to describe. Okay, now, but I'm going to tell you quickly one important property that this, the, the, the homotopy symmetric has. Mm -hmm. uh, because, okay, if I want, if I can do a sneak preview, the homotopy symmetric is the one that uh, satisfies the visage. So mm -hmm. it's the one for which you can build a motivic spectrum out of. And so that's not been, uh, that's not out yet. Uh, the, the flip side is that they're kind of mysterious. <laughs> we don't really have a geometric picture of them yet. Uh, so the, this comparison is actually quite good because it allows you to identify stuff that's well behaved with stuff that's uh, more geometrically intuitive. Yeah, I think that the stupid question is, yeah, are there any rings when this uh, homotopy symmetric coincides with the genuine symmetric? I mean, not in every degree, but as I'm about to say, for Dedekind domains, they coincide on connected covers, uh -huh. which is uh, how we are actually able to compute stuff for Dedekind domains. And okay. in general, it coincides as here from, from degree D minus 2N minus 2, minus 3. Did I still swap two and three? I did. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, no, I didn't, but it was a plus. Ah, sorry. All these indices I'm going to. Uh, don't trust my indices, trust the paper. <laughs> Even if I'm are, you proving this, are you proving these results, these properties of L theory, also just using your definition and some play with complexes? or it's more involved. Yes, that's essentially why, why global dimension is appearing. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just an, so that's the point. L theory with our definition is just something that you can just play with complexes. You can actually give a very explicit uh, uh, formulas with them in terms of complexes of different length. So it's fairly easy to do things. And then you can use this amazing square here, plus the theorem by Wolfgang and, uh, and Fabian to reconstruct uh, the classical growth and bit group from this play, from these games we played with complexes. So that's actually where the true power of the theory comes. You sort of do a lot of abstract nonsense and you end up with, a, with this square that connects two objects which are both concrete and are defined in very, very different ways. So. Nice. 
That's the point. But okay, so let me specialize. Okay, first for fields. So for fields, fields are are uh, well, they're definitely regular Ethereum of dimension zero. So these. So let's say R equals F some field. And in fact, all this theory is interesting only when the field has characteristic two, but. So this is, you, you unwrap everything and you see that this is going to be the bit group for star divisible by four star greater or equal than zero. Sorry, the, the symmetric bit group the quadratic bit group for star divisible by four star greater or equal than minus four. And uh, zero for star divisible by two star different from minus two. No, sorry, for, for star otherwise, uh, well, okay, Let's say the image of this thing from star equals to minus two and zero otherwise. Actually, the zero requires a couple of arguments, but uh, which I haven't said, it identifies pi one with the group of formations, which is similar to the one I did for the bit group. But, uh, so this is, uh, this is very nice. Uh, and let's see what we can say with, for GW of fields. Mm, using this. So now, now let F, FQ be a finite field. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is divisible by four or by two if char F is two. Uh, because the, 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 the congruent to two mod four are actually the anti-symmetric bit group that coincide with the bit group when the field has characteristic two and are zero when the field has characteristic different from two. But we are interested in fact, characteristic two. So now, for example, you can see that the symmetric thing is just this Laurent polynomial ring just F2 in every degree because the bit group of a finite field uh, is always F2 as uh, it's not hard to prove. It's, done, it's completely determined by the rank. Um, so, okay. Then we can consider also, we can also study the date of the K theory. Now by Quillen, we know that the homotopy groups of uh, the K theory are odd torsion groups in dimension greater than zero, or actually different from zero, but okay. So the Tate is the same as the Tate of the pi zero which is Z with the trivial action. And so the homotopy groups of the Tate are just F2 with, it's just the usual homological algebra. This is just the Tate cohomology of Z with the trivial action, um, which is well known to be F2, this, this rumple non thing. So we have a map. And okay, I'm going to. Uh, is a is a graded ring map from F two of U plus or minus one to itself. And now, if you look at it, every homogeneous non-zero element in this ring is invertible. So therefore, every graded ring endomorphism is an automorphism. So it is an as a morphism.
Therefore, let me write again what's happening here. Uh, L F copper S K F copper S homotopy fixed points K F copper S state. This map is an equivalence. This square was Cartesian, so this map is an equivalence. And now it's an immediate computation with a homotopy fixed point spectral sequence using again the equivalence computation of the K theory groups that this thing is uh, the K theory group for star congruent to, I hope I don't misremember, three, not four, GW zero for star equals zero and F2, uh, sorry, greater than zero. F2 for star even, star less than zero and zero otherwise. But um, GWF comma genuine symmetric is connective, as connected. Uh, let me say is an iso in degrees greater or equal than zero by the, the statement on L theory groups. So we found the homotopy groups. of the GW space of F. This was, I mean, this is not a new computation. This was already known. I learned it from a book by Fedorovitz. I'm not sure if it's the original reference where he finds them via homological stability methods. Uh, but the point is that this proof is much, much shorter. You just need to know the bit group of finite fields, which is essentially a triviality, and, and and the K theory groups of finite fields, which are due to equivalent, and then everything falls down. And the, the answer is is this one, and zero in the other degrees. Okay, so that's for fields. And. Okay, now I have, I think, 15 minutes left. So let me quickly go to Dedekind domains since it's what I, I, I promised. And again, here you see that uh, L, R, Q, G, S to L, R, Q, S is an ISO in degrees greater or equal than zero by the bounds I put before. So the map on GR and GW, not GR, sorry, is also an ISO. So you just need, so here are Dedekin domain of dimension one. Okay, for this we need another theorem to compute this. We need another theorem that works only for GW Q kappa S. So that's uh, called the localization sequence. And we're going to generalize it much further in forthcoming work by Kalmes, Harpas, and myself. Uh, but for now, let me just state it for Dedekind domains as it is in the in the big paper. So that so let S a set of primes with chosen uniformizer. Then there exists a fiber sequence. Uh, let me put this for L. Uh, shifted. 
uh, not that R mod P, R over S and R S inverted. And here I'm using R with S inverted a bit loosely because, well, these are prime ideals, but I actually mean, um, actually mean that the, the sub ring of the fraction field uh, of all functions that are regular at those primes, uh, away from those primes, sorry, away from those primes. And the choice of uniformizer is needed to define this map. In general, if you want, um, um, if you want a canonical choice here, you have to use the put the dualizing complex of P. But I'm not going to bother with such niceties. We can twist this. Actually, it's more useful to write it. In, in a shifted way. Oh, I forgot. Where did this maps? And we need an important lemma, which I'm not going to prove because, in fact, it takes one whole page. But it's uh, it's technical and it's not that interesting. I mean, no, it's, it is interesting, but it's it requires. Uh, an understanding of uh, of how how this localization sequence is defined and how the Bissage isomorphism is built. Uh, but okay, this is essentially this boundary map is the classical boundary map that show up for bit groups. So remember, this is the bit group of R with S inverted, and this is the bit group of R mod P. And this sends essentially it's u to zero and brackets u pi to u bar, where u uh, is an element of R that's invertible mod p, and pi is the uniformizer. Okay. And that's actually the, the, the map that was sometimes called Psi 1 in the classical literature on bit groups. OK. So now let me state the last theorem and explain how you get it from this sequence. But Psi n of r copa s, or, or gs, because I'm going to describe the positive degrees. Uh, this, where did I wrote it? Uh, here. You have the, the bit group of R when 4 divides n, oh, actually, n divide congruent to 4, 0 mod 4, 0 for n congruent to 2. The sum over all primes that divide 2 of the bit group of R mod p, and n is congruent to 2, and the co kernel of this map. Delta zero from this thing over all primes for n congruent. No, that's n congruent to one, sorry. And sorry, that's when uh, char r is different from two, yeah, which I mean, two is non zero. It's not necessarily invertible, but it's non zero. There is also a formula for when the characteristic is two, but in the interest of time. And let, and let me just mention that this is peak R mod two if frac R is a number, is a global field, sorry. So this is a, this is a classical theorem actually. But. Okay. So how do you prove this theorem? Well, the n congruent to four is, uh, is, uh, is, is just a general statement that works for every ring. And so let's write the long exact sequence instead. Ah, I had it here prepared, but I forgot. 
so you have pi n l r kappa s goes sorry and here i'm taking okay let me let's write the long exact sequence for s set of all primes so we have that pi star of r with s inverted which is sorry of l of r with s inverted is the bit group of this guy for star congruent to four and zero otherwise because this is a field so let's actually call it um, f which is the, the field so from this we immediately get the statement for n congruent to two because it's, it sits in a sequence with, with everything is zero. And just let's write down. Well, yeah, I didn't say what S was here. So let me say frac R actually. Um, no, 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 sorry. That, no, yeah, that's frac R. Uh, this goes to uh, pi to the bit group of k goes to uh, pi to the sum over p of the bit group of r mod p goes to pi one of l of r goes to pi one of l of oof, f and that's zero. So you see that, call it, oh, pi minus one, pi minus one. You see that this guy is exactly the co-kernel of this zero. So this gives the, the congruence for n congruent to three, to three. And if you continue here, you get, uh, Oh yeah, you get zero. Um, zero and then, well, uh, you, you, you get this object. Sorry, I run out of space and I don't think this makes a lot of sense here. Mm. <sighs> So this was pi zero of L of L of R. And here I have pi one of L of R mod P, sum over P, P which is zero. And this maps um, pi one of L of F, which is again zero, but now something interesting happens. You get pi one of L of R, which is the thing wanted to compute. Then you get the sum over P of pi two of L of R mod P. And then here you get a pi two L of F, which is zero because I had characteristic not two. And this guy is the bit group of R mod P if a two divides P and zero otherwise, since it's the anti-symmetric bit group. And therefore, pi one of L of R is exactly the sum over uh, P divides T of the symmetric bit groups of R mod P, as I promised. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Sorry if the computations at the end became a bit messy. Yeah, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Questions? Uh, can I ask some stupid question about the very beginning of the talk, I think. So you, you define the, uh, the kappa spaces, right? This kind of uh, 
the thing you can you consider k theory of to compute Grotten Duquit or whatever groups. Oh, kappa spaces, yeah. Um, kappa yeah. spaces. Uh, but then you consider this uh, point point career. Like, okay, first question: Kappa spaces form an additive category, right? Or are you saying there are there are no. less morphisms? Uh, I mean, okay, well, we call them Hermitian objects, objects equipped with a form. But you want to restrict to Poincaré objects where the form is unimodular. And those do not form an additive category for the same reason for which vector spaces with a unimodular semantic bilinear form are not an additive category. Because uh, all maps are forced to be injective if they respect a non degenerate semantic bilinear form. I see. But then how do you pass the, like, I mean, I guess you're, you're considering some stable categories in the end. Like, no, how do you? No, no, stable categories are the inputs, but no. I see, I see, I see. You get, I so mean, all... the, the, stable, the ambient stable category gives you a, a canonical symmetric model structure on concrete object given by orthogonal sum. Right. But it's not, it's not a, a direct sum in, in, in any meaningful sense. So your K theory is actually the uh, it's it's actually the group completion of of the uh, of the monoid of an e infinity monoid. Um, I mean, no, I have okay. I haven't said that, but when you define, you actually have to split something that looks like short exact sequences. Okay. So you have it's not just group it's just group completion in the in this special case. Where you have a, a super nice concrete structure like the genuine symmetric or the genuine quadratic. Let's see what is the, the state. But then, how do you define uh, how do you define the negative k groups? Yeah. Okay. I, I, we use the q construction actually. Um, uh, you know how, how? So okay. Yeah. Well, that's probably an important warning. Actually, I should make these negative GW groups are not uh, that have nothing to do with what's usually called non-connected k theory. Mm -hmm. There is a mm -hmm. theory for GW, but it has different negative groups. Um, I see. Here from the fact from the periodicity properties of L theory. And uh, the way we define them is actually using a Q construction kind of thing. So, you know, when you do ordinary K theory, you take the Q construction, you take the geometric realization, and then you, you loop. And it ha what happens is that the geometric realization of the Q construction is connected. So the loop doesn't produce any negative homotopy groups. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, you take Poincare objects in the Q construction, it's not connected anymore. In fact, it's, it's by note is a shifted bit group. Um, and so uh, the bit groups appear in negative degrees. Uh, it's just what you need to make the long degree sequences work. Um, in the end. Otherwise, you would have a long exact sequence that ends abruptly without any zeros. So sometimes it's just better to throw in some negative homotopy groups and have an, a proper long exact sequence. Thanks. In the end, you gave some computations for. Uh, Genon symmetric guys. And okay. do you also, yeah? I mean, do you also have the computations for quadratic? Yes, I didn't talk about them because they, they use, since the localization sequence doesn't work for them, you need to do uh, use different technique. You need to use what we call the completion square. Uh, but we do have, let me actually write it down. Well, let me. Right. Since I have them in front of me, let me write down uh, the statement for, for the L groups. And we unfortunately, the, so the, the, the symmetric, I didn't say it, but we actually know what they are. Uh, also when, when frac r is, so it's the bit, in this case, it's the bit in degree zero and peak mod two in degree congruent to one, mod two, if frac r has child two, uh, star greater than or equal than zero. 
but unfortunately, in the quadratic case, we are not able to determine what happens when the fraction field of R has characteristic two. That's annoying, but um, uh, well, this just means that there is some work to be done. So actually, let me write it down. The statement pi star of uh, I feel it, the quadratic guys. Um, since they're for the four periodic that coincide with the genuine quadratic in. Oh, no, sorry. Perhaps actually, let me first make an observation that's important. Uh, what a weird thing that happens for the genuine quadratic L theory group, L theory spectrum is just, it's just a double suspension of the genuine symmetric. So, the, all that's missing to, to compute the, the genuine quadratic L theory group is to figure out the negative homotopy groups of the genuine symmetric. And the negative homotopy groups of the genuine symmetric are controlled by the homotopy quadratic by that bound that I said. And it's a quality that you stated that is for any R? For any R, yes. It's an hmm. avatar of Karubi periodicity. This is a much more general statement, actually. And essentially, the point is that um, uh, the, the, the tate of R is uh, two periodic. So the second truncation, the one that determines the, 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 the genuine quadratic, is just the double suspension of the zero truncation. That's essentially what's making this work. Now I'm, I'm skipping details, but. Okay. And, and so you need only the low degree terms and just let me write them down for star congruent to zero mod four, zero for star congruent to one mod four, and the sum over all primes that divide two for star congruent to two mod four. And uh, that is something much more complicated is essentially an extension for star congruent to three mod four. And this is when the characteristic of frac R is known to. Uh, when the characteristic is two, we, we, we do not actually know the answer. We have some partial results, but uh, unfortunately a map that's an isomorphism and the characteristic of frac R is known to is the zero map when the characteristic is two. And this kind of screws up the computations. You said that you don't have a localization sequence here. Have a localization you mean sequence. that it fails or you don't know? No, no, it fails. It fails. Okay. There are counter examples. Yeah, okay. just and so you have to use a different technique by completing R2 and using some kind of completion, completion fracture square. Mm -hmm. Do symplectic or skew symmetric forms somehow appear in this? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Yes, so for example, uh, yeah, for example, let me actually, this is a true statement for any ring, so actually for any community ring. Uh, you can take the genuine symmetric, the genuine anti-symmetric, and that's the sigma one of the genuine symmetric for plus. And that's again an, a, yet another instance. Uh, no, wait. Oh, sorry, no. Uh, I lost a, a two. <laughs> okay, now 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 it's better. Sorry, this, this didn't the neurology wasn't working. Right? Yet another instance of Karubi periodicity. We have a general Karubi periodicity theorem, which in fact it's telling you. Actually, at this point, I could actually tell you the general theorem. So. Except that I'm probably going to mess up uh, the indices, but I think that's the correct version. No, plus one, plus one. So, yeah, okay. where minus means uh, instead of, and in fact, here you can put L and minus L, just put a line bundle and line bundle with um, anti symmetric duality. Okay. And the same thing for actually from GW. Well, Okay, and 
Hey, yeah. I, I mean, that's um, something that I could write, but you have to give me a second because uh, for L theory, everything is much simpler because the periodicity is just a shift. For GW, mm -hmm. um, you have a spectral sequence and etc. Can you move a little bit uh, up? I mean, where you said before that you have Karugi periodicity. Yeah. Because this is like this corresponds to kappa greater or equal than two, and this is kappa greater or equal than zero. So you do you apply this carry periodicity twice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question: Do you have any kind of mismatch excision or homotopy invariance? Yes. Like that? yes. Yes. I'm so happy you ask. So, okay, <laughs> this is, uh, this is uh, forthcoming work, actually. So this, let me write it pre-theorem because we have written it down, but uh, well, maybe it requires some more work by Kalmes, Harpas, and myself. Uh, so, okay, that I haven't defined it for you, actually. Well, I have defined nothing for you, actually. But there is a version of this also for schemes. Okay, the functor that sends x to gw x um, kappa greater or equal than n and actually you can put a line bundle and whatever is an isnevich sheaf for every n uh, when x is quasi compact quasi separated of course as usual in these things um, uh, but the, the thing is that you need the symmetric, in, but it's A1 invariant only when uh, N is minus infinity, i.e. for kappa S. So it's sort of uh, this, this thing, it, the, the, the GW gets more and more intuitive as the greater n is sort of the geometric objects are the one that come from from positive n, so to speak. They are the one they can be written actually as group completions of stuff. But the thing that's actually well behaved from a motivic perspective is the one for very negative n. And uh, well, that's a tension we are still working on on uh, understanding properly. Is this is this um, an answer? Yeah, more or less. I mean, this equality that only for n equals to minus infinity. I mean, for any other n, it is not a one invariant. Or... For any one, it's not a one invariant because you can find some very, very negative L, L theory groups that are W. I can tell you actually what the problem. The problem is that WQ is not a one invariant because we have this form, this quadratic form in WQ of Z of F2, let me say over a field, over F2 brackets T, that is sent to zero in WQ of F2 when T goes to zero, but to the generator, and that's a Z mod two, by the way, when T goes to uh, one. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is this fundamental obstruction. It's very explicit. You can write it down. You can see exactly what's happening. And uh, and essentially for n greater than minus infinity, there is some very negative L theory group, which is WQ of your thing. Uh, so that that for that 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 kills the A1 invariance then. For n minus infinity, you're pushing away WQ at infinity and it never happens. And in fact, it is A1 invariant. Okay. I mean, it was for... Sorry? Does this form really belongs to WQ? I mean, it doesn't look unimodular or something like that. Oh, it, is. it is actually because actually let me, okay, let's look at this form. Closely, so this is a quadratic form over F2 brackets T. What is its polarization? Its polarization is exactly the form 0, 1, 1, 0. 
Ah, okay, right, right. And, that, and that's and that's always in modular. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you can do the computation if you want, but the point is that no, 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 it's okay. Yeah, the point is that I x square respects addition. So to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, it has a Lagrangian when t is zero, and it doesn't. It has an Arf invariant one when t is one. In fact, the Arf invariant of this Q is exactly t. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, can I ask some last question? Some last stupid question. Uh, do you have a BGT kind of result? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we have so what, 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 is a short, what is a short exact sequence of like categories with Poincaré structure or whatever? I, mean, I haven't defined to you what a Poincaré structure on infinity category is, but it's some kind of quadratic functor. Right, and the duality, I guess. And uh, the quadratic functor determines the duality, actually. Well, right. Uh -huh. And the, the condition is that this is a Verdier sequence. Is a sorry, is a split Verdier sequence. Like the then uh, Copper prime is just copper restricted to C. And copper double prime is the left can extension of copper to C double prime. Mm -hmm. so the condition of what we call a, a split Poincaré Verdier sequence. If you don't put split, you get just what we call a Poincaré Verdier sequence. And uh, that's actually not as crazy as it you might look like. I mean, uh, this is the same it's thing the as a bifiber sequence in the category of Poincaré categories. So. so this is what you use to prove uh, this kind of. Uh, with everything. I mean, localization the... sequences above. Yes, yes. But that's cool. that's actually why it's non-trivial for the localization sequence. The localization sequence is trivial. Is this exactly this last kind of extension part? Because at some point you want to commute a co-limit with a, a, a homotopy orbit, homotopy fixed points. Sorry. And that you cannot do in general. You can do in the case of schemes. But for example, I would expect this to fail for the right schemes. So there's clearly, not for, sorry, for spectral schemes or even the right schemes actually, because you need some kind of uniform upper bound on the connectivity of things. Um, so that, that, that's clearly stuff where, where there's still work to be done. Yeah. Sounds fun. Yeah, yeah. I hope we have something soon. But. More questions? Okay, it seems to be not the case. So thank you again. Uh, Dennis, could you please send me the notes for that you made during the talk? We will put I it can't in mind. Send you, but okay. <laughs> Caveat emptor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll send you later. Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, if you feel uncomfortable about uh, that, I, I, you know that the quality is not very high <laughs> of the writing, but uh, I'm happy to share them. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the talk. My pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>